Committee on the Implementation of the National Redress Scheme. Uh, my name is Senator Dean Smith and I'm the Chair of the Committee and this evening I'm joined by Dr Anne Webster and Senator Rachel Seward. Um, in accordance with the Committee's resolution of the 5th of December 2019, this hearing will be broadcast on the Parliament's website and the proof and official transcripts of proceedings will be published on the Parliament's website. I also remind members of the media who may be present or listening on the web of the need to fairly and accurately report the proceedings of the committee. Um, I welcome to the committee uh, this evening Ms Catherine Campbell, the Secretary of the Department of Social Services, Ms uh, Emma Kate McGurk, Group Manager for the Redress Scheme, and Mr John Riley. Uh, the Branch Manager, Redress External Management. Uh, we welcome you and thank you very much for making your time available so late in the evening. Um, I've introduced members of the committee. Um, would you like to make a brief opening statement or are you happy to proceed straight to questions? Straight to questions. Great, thank, thank you very much. Me. Well, Secretary, can I just uh, reiterate a comment I made at Senate Estimates, estimates just to um, thank you and the Department for the, um, the cooperation you have extended to this committee over the life of its work thus far in this Parliament, and uh, officials have always been uh, ready to make themselves very, very available to our questions, both in public and private hearing, which has uh, greatly assisted our deliberations. Unfortunately, that is a Senate division Bell. I'll just check to see if that's a quorum call. Sure, it's, uh, it's a division, so my apologies. We'll just have to suspend briefly until senators return. Um, apologies for that, but uh, the perils of a parliamentary sitting evening. We won't be too long. So I might just invite Senator Seward to start with some questions. I certainly have some questions, and I'll also invite Dr Webster and Senator Pratt also. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, can I st I wanted to go to the issue around uh, the Princess Trust and where we're up to with the Princess Trust. And um, first off, can I ask, um, when was your latest contact with the with the Princess Trust and or Fairbridge Restored? Um, Emma Kate McGuirk, uh, Group Manager Redress. The last meeting that we had with the Princess Trust was uh, the 5th of November. And the most recent meeting we had with um, the administrators of Fairbridge Restored Limited was the 26th of November. That was with Fairbridge Restored? That's correct. Okay. And in your, um, in your uh, evaluation, how close do you see, try, see you are at trying to find a resolution for the matter in hand in terms of Fairbridge? In terms of, I'm, I'm looking at it from the perspective of the survivors, we know there's problems with Fairbridge Restored being able to join the scheme yes. because of the way the scheme's set up. Um, have you proposed any resolutions to them about how they could join? So in respect of Fairbridge Restored Limited, um, we believe we've um, exhausted, with Fairbridge Restored Limited, opportunities given their current restrictions under UK insolvency law. Um, based on the information that they've provided us, um, we can't see that they would be able to join the scheme and commit to the eight years ahead. Um, we are still trying to work constructively with the Prince's Trust uh, in order to find a way for them to potentially uh, join the scheme, which would be what we would look for. So the point's been made about Prince's Trust being the funder of last resort, whereas, as I understand it, is that, uh, first off I'll ask, is that how you see it? Are you approaching the Princess Trust with the view that they are the funder of last, they can be a funder of last resort? So funder of last resort under the scheme has a very specific definition um, funder of last resort is where an institution is defunct, so there is no um, 
working institution, no umbrella institution that would take responsibility. Where that is the case, if there has been equal responsibility with a state, territory or the Commonwealth Government, that's when the funder of last resort mm. under the legislation kicks in. That's not the situation we're talking that's about right. with the Prince's Trust. With the Prince's Trust, we're looking uh, for them to be essentially an umbrella organisation, a related party, uh, that would take responsibility um, for all aspects of um, the responsibility an institution would have. So the payments, but also direct personal response. Okay, so on what basis have you, you've explored this or put this to the Princess Trust? Um, we've been talking with them about it, yes. Okay. And what has been their response? So I'm a bit... Um, we don't have um, full consent based on the last meeting we had with them to, to discuss with the, the committee all the details of that. Um, there do um, appear to be some issues relating to um, how the Prince's Trust can operate under charities legislation mm. in the United Kingdom, um, but we're still working with them to, to see what resolution there can be. Okay. Have you had a meeting with, because uh, I understand this intersects with the AGS points, you'll be aware, I'm sure, that I, a number of us ask questions. Um, during estimates, yes, uh, and there's the issue around the civil, civil litigation, litigation, yes. and the redress scheme. Have you had a or sought to have a meeting between the AGS, DSS, and either the Princess Trust and or Fairbridge Restored? The matter of civil litigation and the redress scheme—they're two very separate issues. Um, we haven't had uh, a meeting with the various um, Commonwealth Government parties and the Prince's Trust. Why not? I, I, I hear what you're saying about being very different. There's a lot of people that don't see them as very different. Um, and I'm sure you're aware there's one pot of money. And that I, I, at this stage, there's one pot of money. So why would you not at least have a meeting between all the players to see, uh, to get all the cards on the table as much as possible? I suppose we believe we've been doing that by meeting with the Prince's Trust. We can't um, be in the Department of Social Services, can't access some of the information about the, the litigation. So we've been trying to work through with the Prince's Trust what can be achieved under the redress legislation. And, and in terms of um, a pot of money, it's, I mean, as you're aware and as we've spoken about in other, um, other committee hearings, um, it's, it's more than just a pot of money. It's actually about being able to join the scheme in order to see out the next eight years. And that's what we're focusing on, rather than just looking at a pot of money, all of the things that are involved in joining the redress scheme. Have, have you looked at any amendments that would need to be made to the scheme to enable either Fairbridge Restored or the Princess Trust to join? We're certainly looking at all options we've got under the current legislation. Uh, in order no, to progress applications, naming Fairbridge institutions in consultation with our state and territory colleagues. I'm glad, I mean, I'm glad to hear that, but it's not what I asked. I said, have you looked at any amendments? Um, I haven't looked at any specific amendments, Senator, no. Well, I mean, the department, not you, obviously oh, the you the yourself, yes, but sorry. the department has not. Yeah. Um, the second anniversary review, which I'm sure um, uh, you're aware of, and I know you've met with, um, with Ms Crook, mm. We are certainly aware that they're considering a range of issues. There have um, certainly been um, the issue of Fairbridge has been discussed um, with her uh, and we expect that you know, there'll be some commentary in, uh, when we receive the report. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask, can I go back to the Princess Trust and ask, have you explored with them how they, the point you've made about them, them joining the scheme? Have you explored with them the basis on which you think they should be joining? 
in other words, how they took out, how they... Um, it's the legal basis. The legal the basis, yes, that's a good, yeah. Well, back, I think it was in 2013, um, when Fairbridge essentially dissolved, merged um, with the Prince's Trust. Uh, the fact that the Prince's Trust has significant records um, relating to all the Fairbridge institutions. Um, it's been on that basis that we've been conducting our discussions with them as a suitable organisation to take responsibility for the Fairbridge farm schools. Have you asked to see their records? Have you made any, have you looked through their records? Or has anybody on the department's behalf or have you commissioned anyone to look at their records? Uh, no, not directly to look at records. We have asked them um, details about what's in their records uh, to the extent of um, which farm schools and that, that type of thing, but not the um, individual by individual, no. Okay. Are they so, here or in the United Kingdom? In the United Kingdom. All of them? Are all, all of the, records. the relevant records in the United Kingdom? There must be relevant records still here in Australia, surely. Or were they literally sent from Australia back to the United Kingdom? The records that um, the Princess Trust hold are about child migrants who were sent to Australia, so that's the, the records that they have. There are other records in Australia um, from a different state and territory governments, for example, um, have records Which, as well. So the Princess Trust doesn't have those records? No, they would relate to um, mm. people yeah, being state wards, essentially. Yeah. Can I ask? Uh, can I ask one more? One more, no Okay, sorry, fair enough. Um, in terms then of, sorry, do I understand this correctly? You you think that Princess Trust could then be the basically the 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 member that joins the scheme, or the funder of the member that joins the scheme, on the basis that they hold the records. I, it, it, this goes to whether you think that they have the liability of taking on responsibility for the abuse that was carried out by Fairbridge before they had anything to do with it? Well, this is, um, we do look at the fact that the Fairbridge merged with the Prince's Trust back in 2013, um, that they are actively engaged in, for example, the, the, um, the litigation process uh, through Fairbridge Restored Limited. Have you, the have you asked also, them whether they accept that? On, on what base, have you discussed what basis you are making those decisions that they should be so in that position? We've been talking with um, the Prince's Trust um, for some years now. Um, they were looking at ways um, or possibilities for the Trust to be able to respond to Fairbridge claims. So that was the um, the understanding we've been working with them over the, the last couple of years. Um, the trust went through a court process, so the Prince's Trust were the ones that went through the court process in the UK to have Fairbridge reinstated um, in order to, to see whether that would be a suitable way to deal with it. So the Prince's Trust have been um, incredibly closely related to this process and it's under those circumstances that we continue to talk with them. When the Prince's... Sorry, Dr Winston. When the Prince's Trust um, uh, acquired uh, the Drake Fellowship and as a result of that the uh, interest in Fairbridge, do you think that they were aware of the full extent of um, these issues and the liabilities that arose? can't comment on exactly what they knew. Certainly issues relating to Fairbridge Farm Schools have been in the public arena for some time since. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr Webster. Mm -hmm. yeah, look, thank you for your evidence. Are you off again? Uh, no, I'm not. No, I think I'm, I might be. I am, but uh, if that's it's why a, I'm to stay too. Yep. Yes, if, depending what kind of vision. No, that's, that's fine. I said to um, the chair I'm able to stay, that yep. I would. Yep. I can stay, down. yep, I can stay Great. so we can continue. That's what I'm about to go first. What, I'm curious, in the midst of all of this complexity and, let's face it, fairly, um, I don't know even how you describe the mess that survivors from Fairbridge uh, would be viewing this situation, 
what hope can you provide them? What way forward uh, can you provide them that redress is possible, that an apology is possible, that uh, some closure from this, if that's possible either, uh, can occur, whether it's Prince's Trust or whether it's Fairbridge. Yeah. Um, the department is, is very committed to trying to find a way forward. Um, uh, as I said before to, to Senator Seward, the department's assessing all options that are available underneath the legislation to progress applications naming Fairbridge affiliated institutions. And we're doing that um, uh, in consultation with our state and territory colleagues as well. So how, can you give an estimation of how many people from the historic Fairbridge institutions have actually come forward seeking redress? Do you know? Um, we're certainly aware of the number of applications that have been lodged with the scheme to date. Yep. Um, our protected information um, rules say that I can't talk about the, the exact number. Certainly a number that's been um, talked about before has been around 60 and I can certainly confirm that it's in the vicinity uh, yep. of that, um, noting that applications come in you know, uh, with, with regularity. Um, we're certainly aware that there are more Fairbridge survivors out there than that number, but whether they choose to, to put in an application or not, uh, I, I don't know. But that number is you know, in the ballpark. So I have one final question. Uh, you spoke earlier about the second anniversary review. When is that going to be made public? Um, the review is due to be delivered to the minister in February. OK. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. The Fairbridge matters have been regularly described as complex. Um, can you just explain uh, why, why they are complex? What has given rise to the complexity of this particular matter? Well, already what we've been discussing mm -hmm. with the, the nature of um, the organisation Fairbridge no longer existing and being reinstated and then when it was reinstated immediately going into administration. So that's a, that's a level of complexity just there and then the interactions with the Prince's Trust. Um, there are other complexities uh, around the number of different schools around the country, so we're not just dealing with one particular jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, inst uh, schools use the name Fairbridge after the founder, but there's a lot of research that needs to be done about whether that particular institution was actually affiliated officially or whether they just took the name. Uh, and then there's also um, a range of different circumstances uh, that survivors come from. Mm -hmm. So many were child migrants. Um, some were not child migrants. Some were state wards. Mm -hmm. Others don't fit into either of those categories uh, and um, were left um, at the farm school by their parents. So there's a, a lot of different moving parts um, associated with this. Would it be right to say, um, would it be right for me to say that the design of the scheme may not have contemplated this set of circumstances? The international dimension, the scale and scope of jurisdictional involvement, um, the complexity around the insolvency matter in British law, I think the complexity around insolvency in British law is is probably the, the one that um, was more out of scope. Uh, mm -hmm. The other issues are manageable within the current scheme. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you've been having discussions with the Prince's Trust, um, has the matter of a direct personal response been raised with them and the capacity for one to be offered in, instance, in an instance? perhaps, I'm speculating, where the Princess Trust and Fairbridge Restored were not able to participate in the scheme? Generally, most of our discussions about direct personal response have been um, in association with joining the scheme. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had specific discussions mm -hmm. about um, a separate one if they're not able to join. But if they're not able to join the scheme, then that might be that does not mean, that does not exclude the possibility for a discussion around uh, direct personal responses. Uh, to negotiate something, no, it doesn't. Great, thank you. Um, 
is in the Senate estimates process just recently, I asked officials, uh, were they working to a strategy to resolve the um, Fairbridge matter? Uh, the answer was, yes, Senator, we are working to a strategy, and I was happy to take that on face value. Are we still working to a strategy? Uh, yes, we're working with um, uh, relevant lawyers, as I said before, to look at what's available under our mm. legislation. This is not a reflection on the DSS, but it is a reflection on the Australian Government Solicitor and the Department of Home Affairs, who I think this committee would come to the view have not demonstrated any sense of urgency or responsiveness to uh, responding to Prince of the Prince's Trust matters. I just want to be very, very sure that the Department of Social Services is responding in a very, very effective and efficient way, because I was a little bit concerned about talking about the second anniversary review, review process, which reports to government in February. Government will then contemplate the response. The response is, so we're dealing with, you know, there is a, there's an urgency around these sorts of issues and matters that I haven't seen in the Department of Home Affairs and the Australian Government Solicitor, which I am outraged about. I just want to be a reassured, Secretary, that um, that you know time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. Chair, I can assure you there is a sense of urgency for us about this matter. I think we've talked about a number of elements of the strategy this evening. Mm -hmm. uh, we remain very committed to trying to resolve this mm -hmm. as quickly as we can. So based on the evidence I've heard tonight, um, am I right to assume that the um, the scheme is looking at alternative med mechanisms or remedies to deal with the Fairbridge matter? Uh, I think it's fair to say what the evidence that have been given by Ms McGurk is that we have uh, we have looked at the strategy of dealing directly with the Prince's Trust, with Fairbridge uh, restored, as well as uh, indicated that uh, Ms Cruck, who's doing the second year review, has also turned her mind mm. to this, and we have engaged with her on this as well. Mm -hmm. So in evidence that's been put before the committee and now is on the public record, it's clear that the Prince's Trust uh, views the, it's the National Redress Scheme recourse to uh, redress and the civil litigant path uh, course to redress as one and the same in its views, in its negotiations with government, why is it that the Department of Social Services hasn't felt the need to sit around the same table um, if an outside entity is looking at these issues as being interconnected? Why wouldn't the Department of Social Service, Services be sitting around the table with the Department of Home Affairs and the Australian Government Solicitor to try and work out these issues? So I don't think we're able to because we're not able to access that information that's held by Home Affairs and the Government Solicitor. And why not? Uh, because that information is, um, uh, uh, my understanding, it's legal in confidence to them. Do we have any additional? John Riley. Branch Manager, External Engagement, Redress Group. Uh, that's right, Secretary. We, the civil litigation is fundamentally that and separate from the redress scheme. So we're not joined as, DSS is not separately joined as a party we, to We that. all know that, Mr Riley. We all know that now. Why is it that for so long the Prince's Trust has been able to, to a proposition to government that um, that has these matters intertwined. Why has that been allowed to be? Why has that proposition been allowed to be put to government for such a long period of time? When the government, uh, it's clear to me through through evidence, have, has never regarded these things as intertwined. So again, this just goes back to my point about um, you know, um, you know why, why have these sort of falsehoods been allowed to? to continue, why haven't people put themselves around the table? And this was a suggestion I had made to officials and to the minister that DHA, AGS and DSS should get themselves around the table to sort this out. But we just heard tonight that we haven't had any, my words, any interdepartmental discussions, which again goes to my sense of concern around urgency. Senator, I wonder whether it's not that we 
haven't had any discussions. Mm -hmm. I understand we have had discussions mm -hmm. with Home Affairs and the Australian Government Solicitor. It's just that we haven't had discussions with those two parties ourselves and the Prince's Trust. Ah, OK, I take that back. I, yeah. I withdraw that. I withdraw that. Thank ah. you very much for that. Thank you very much for that clarification. So, so, um, so we're working to a strategy. We're looking at alternative mechanisms. Are we working to a timeline? Are we saying we want this matter fixed by June and working backwards, or by February and working backwards, or by Christmas and working backwards? So, Senator, I think it's fair to say some elements of the strategy involve others and external parties, which we may not be able to um, keep to a yep. timeline, but we are working uh, expeditiously. I know within the department this is a matter that I am regularly mm -hmm. briefed on. Uh, yeah. I probably deal with redress every day, yeah. and, um, and this is a regular discussion. And, 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 and again, Secretary, thank you very much for making your, you know, your being present here for us tonight. I, I really do appreciate it as as committee. Now, that's a Senate bill, but I can continue to stay. Um, can you stay? Would you stay after uh, I'll have to go. Once we do the reels, I'll have to go. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. So, uh, thank you. Just um, Senator Pratt, would you? Chopping things through very shortly. Yeah, we'll based get on to the nine. variation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Senator some Pratt, do you have will some? While we're waiting for Senator Pratt, just a, a query from me. So, um, we've heard the. Um, the figure of approximately 60 applications before the scheme uh, at the moment. Has any uh, effort been made to estimate, um, uh, guess, what, what number might um, not yet have approached the scheme? I don't think we have, and yeah. the initial estimates that were made mm. at the start of the redress scheme, I don't think we're seeing play out anyway yeah, on those numbers. Yeah, right. So yeah, yeah. whatever we had, I don't think um, we would use again because it's not I, playing I, out. I, I'd agree with that. That's right. Yeah, I agree with that. Very, very difficult to um, difficult to contextualise. So, um, so then, so what is the what, what are the what are the next three or four steps in the process in regards to the Fairbridge matter? Because this is my uh, again, I've, I've shared this uh, um, uh, in the, in the Senate. I am someone who believes that the scheme has improved considerably since inception. There has been necessary recalibration, but that has worked well. I think it, it is absolutely delivering outcomes for people. Um, but the Fairbridge matter has been a um, has been a difficult one. Has been a difficult one, and and I characterise it as unique. You know, a set of circumstances that perhaps couldn't have been foreseen. Um, a scheme gets designed based on all the available knowledge and evidence after a Royal Commission process, um, and it's you know, unfortunate but not impossible that some things don't get seen uh, until the scheme is up, up and operating. And that's how I would characterise where we're up to with the Fairbridge matter. So, um, but what are, what are the next two or three steps that we can, we can expect to, uh, or, we could, or we could ask to be reported, progress to be reported back to the committee? Was the, we're currently um, speaking with um, the Australian government solicitors said, about those options, so that's really where um, some of those next steps are, identifying legally viable options um, for us to progress. Mm -hmm. um, and then the step after that is in, involves our state and territory colleagues uh, talking with them about those options because they're very much linked. Yeah, and, uh, and and again, I think I've said this on the public record. I'm in receipt of a letter from the Premier of Western Australia, who has said uh, that he's very very keen to 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 um, to deal with these matters expeditiously. Uh, was his uh, was his words? Yes. So, Senator uh, Senator Pratt, sorry. Yep. May, may I ask, uh, do you have any sense of the records in terms of assets that Fairbridge disposed of in Australia? So clearly, you've talked about them being transferred to other school identities. Some of them will have gone to other charitable purposes. Do you have any sense which of those were disposed of commercially or have, might have been acquired that have... So commercially, so the value went to the United Kingdom and the Prince's Trust through Fairbridge or those that are retained locally because it does have 
you know, you've dealt with the complexity in terms of church parishes that have been taken over by other parishes. You, you've been through all of those. What do those relationships look like here? Um, I mean, there there is no entity called no, no, Fairbridge I know there's no with entity, any but they've assets. Just, Fairbridge originally disposed of assets as an institution. You know, for example, Fairbridge Farm in Western Australia is now a, a charitable, was used for music, but land in the area has actually been redeveloped for a lot of commercial redevelopment purposes. The state's got, you know, the sense is, do you, you know, if it's the Catholic Church, they've consolidated their assets, they've sold things, they've done things, they own schools, um, and they have that liability. Here we're looking about dispersed assets that were previously associated with the institution where they've divested themselves. And the sense is, well, who has the economic liability in terms of who has the economic reward from those assets and did they, how did they acquire them? Um, I don't Is that something that's been looked at by the department or by um, the redress scheme as a whole? So as part of an, any institution joining the scheme, we, we look at its, in its simplest form, we look at two consecutive years of financial statements. We make an estimate of their redress liability we then make a we make a judgment of the of the risks okay, do you... associated with that. In this instance, mm. we've never got that far. Okay, you never even got that far. We've in never terms got of that far with statements. Fairbridge because Fairbridge Restored Limited was unable to join the scheme, so we didn't have an institution to to seek that information. Did you do from. any of the more historical inquiry about whether, you know, are there other institutions you should have chased? How do you work out who is actually liable in this case? So, for example, I take the example of all the people over history that were at Fairbridge Farm in Western Australia. Um, where, where does the legal liability for that currently rest with the Prince's Trust or Fairbridge Restored? Where? So I think that's the crux of what we're yes. talking about is, um, uh, my understanding is it's with Fairbridge Restored? Yes. Yeah, okay. All yeah. right, that, that's fine. And it's not necessarily relevant yeah. to my question. Nevertheless, Fairbridge Farm exists as a rather large land asset that someone acquired probably under a charitable purpose without ever having acquired a liability for any of that history. How have you dealt with those issues in the context of redress? Have we as a far parliament failed to deal with it? How's that been managed? So because I'd clearly you've dealt with those kinds of legacy issues in other institutions. But other institutions are generally um, ongoing mm. propositions. And so they will have had the assets. Uh, the redress scheme, as I understand it, deals with the assets that are available to, to the that institution. institution but what if, to which what if the Catholic Church gave away all its assets to a, you know, uh, or, or, or some other church gave away all their assets in order, to, in order to divest themselves of that liability? You wouldn't let them Well, we do haven't it. been presented with that situation, Senator. Well, it's a, you know, it's a long-term historical issue. I'm just trying to work out the level of curiosity, because part of it is you can put the onus on the United Kingdom government, but it also says, okay, well, you can put the onus on the West Australian government, or you can put the onus on the Commonwealth government as a liability, because those assets were divested and still retain a value. Uh, so my understanding is the legislation doesn't go to no, what doesn't. may have been in previous organisations. It goes to the institution which holds liability and their current assets because of the need to join the scheme for eight years and for to be able to fund those yeah. issues. And in, in a general sense, the parliament was confident that we had a money trail that we could follow yeah. under those circumstances. But I think Fairbridge, uh, even historically, when we put redress together, was always a marginal proposition in that, in that context, as far as I could tell, even reflecting on the parliamentary debates at the time. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that's, it's not the fault of the bureaucracy, it might well be our fault as legislators. 
uh, but there are still significant assets uh, that Fairbridge used uh, right around the country. But I'm not sure that they... I understand your point, which is who has now got the economic benefit from those assets? Uh, well, were they... Did they buy them or were they given them? If they bought them, then where did that money go? Well, um, I'm not... Um, we can take your question on notice. Yes, thank but you. But my understanding of the legislation is it relates to the entity and it, as it stands. No, I understand. And you're limited by yeah. that. But, I, you know, it's our job to be curious about these things so that we can try and fix those problems. Certainly. And, um, Senator, we'll look at what, what research was done before anyone here uh, at, at the table was, uh, was working in the scheme and come back to you on notice with what we can find. Thank you. Any I think that's questions? me sorted. Yeah, we, um, we're just uh, preempting a series of rolling divisions now that the guillotine is, well, I shouldn't say the guillotine, the variation of business hours is about, <laughs> to, <laughs> is about, to, is about to kick in. But again, can I just um, uh, thank you for um, uh, being willing to appear before us. Um, as you know, the Fairbridge matter is top of mind for the committee, but as is the second, um, the second independent review process, so we are looking forward uh, to that and um, any information that uh, the department feels that you might be able to provide to us over coming week and uh, um, um, weeks uh, in regards to Fairbridge matters or any key developments would be much uh, appreciated. And again, we appreciate you are um, uh, waiting for us while we concluded our private hearing on a matter uh, and then making yourself available for this public hearing. So again, we're very, very appreciative of everything you do for the survivors and for the scheme uh, and your attentiveness to uh, our needs as a, as a parliamentary committee. So thank you very much and, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.